guest speaker, Mr. Rohan Bilimoya, sir, uh, Dr. Debarati Halda, professor at UWSL, and Malaysia, assistant dean at UWSL. Uh, now, a quick introduction of our guest, uh, guest speaker today, Mr. Rohan Bilimoya. Uh, Billy Moya, sir, is an international legal professional and he is a founder of a legal platform known, known as Legal Ninjas, and uh, where he facilitates students and uh, academic community uh, uh, practical knowledge and uh, le- uh, practical knowledge of legal functionality. Sir has a uh, sir has a market experience of big U.S. law firms, uh, Magic Circle firms, and Fortune 500 firms. He has gained, gained his experience uh, in various countries and worked in various countries such as London, India, Moscow, Tokyo are some of them. Uh, Sir has also uh, served as a senior in-house counsel for KFC India, uh, Asia, KFC Asia, uh, Pizza Hut Asia Pacific, and uh, and he was also a former attorney at a law firm, Linklaters and Mayor Brown. Mayor Brown. Now, moving forward, I would like to inform all the participants that that all the queries you have, kindly drop them in the chat oh, box. Thank you, Drinanda. Please actually switch off your mic, please. Uh, yes, yes, and please, uh, I kindly request all the participants to switch off their mics for the whole session. And any queries you have, you can drop them in the chat box, and so will uh, uh, address it accordingly. And uh, one more thing, at the end of the session, I request all of the participants and the uh, and our guests and all our teachers to uh, start their cameras so that we can take a group photo at the end of the session. Thank you. So now okay. you can start the session. Thanks so much, Prakya, and thanks so much, Dr. Patel, and thank you, Parinas, as well, for setting up this session. I'm very excited to be talking to you all today. Uh, so my name is Rohan, and I am calling you from Sydney, Australia. So it's about nine o'clock in the evening for me. So not too late, but uh, I'm very, very excited. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have a very productive and very uh, informative uh, next hour. So the focus of today's session is all of you. It's not me. So I want to hear about what questions you have, what challenges you're facing, uh, what kinds of things are stressing you out right now. But just before we kind of launch into the actual substance of the session, let me give you a little bit, maybe two minutes of background about myself, just so you kind of know what I've done and where I've come from, so that you know what kinds of questions I'll be able to answer. So for example, if you ask me about tax laws in Gujarat, I'm fairly sure I'm not the best person for that, but uh, I'm happy to answer most other questions. So as uh, Prakya said, so, uh, you know, I, I was actually born in Delhi. So I was born in Delhi and I went to St. Columbus School, which if any of you know, was the school that uh, <laughs> Shah Rukh Khan went to. So that's my only claim to fame in life. Uh, and then when I was 14, my family and I moved to Sydney and I did my last three years of high school and my university here. And in uh, Australia, similar to India, your law degree is, is five years. And uh, in Australia, you have to combine it with something else. You have to do law and arts or law and science or law and finance. Uh, I chose to do law and finance. And then at the end of that five-year journey, I um, took up a job, my first job with a law firm called Linklaters in London. So I worked with them for a couple of years and then I moved around with them to Moscow, Tokyo, and then Singapore. And then uh, I worked with them for about three years in Singapore in their finance banking team. Uh, and then I moved to a U.S. law firm called Mayor Brown, but still in their Singapore office. Uh, I love the food in Singapore too much. Uh, and then uh, in 2017, so again, about three years at Mayor Brown. And 2017, I decided to move into the world of fast food. So I, I went to a company called Yum, which is the parent company of KFC, Pizza Hut, and Taco Bell. So I hope all of you like your fast food. Uh, if you don't, no worries. Nobody's perfect. Um, And then just in November last year, so what, four or five months ago, I decided to move back to Sydney where all my friends and family are. uh, And I'm currently an in-house lawyer at an Australian bank. So that's my kind of work experience. But on the side, uh, I run this platform called Law Ninjas. And it's essentially, uh, it's been going for about four years now. So again, 2017, it started off. Uh, our website is, let me type it into the chat so you guys can kind of see it. Uh, if I can access the chat. 
So it's lawninjas.co. So if you guys uh, check it out, um, we have um, a weekly workshops. So we run free weekly workshops every Thursday. So in fact, just after this session uh, at 11 p.m. Sydney time, which is about two hours from now, there's a one hour workshop starting that's open to all of you guys uh, and everybody else. And here's the link. It's free registration. And the topic for this uh, week is international arbitration. So it's a panel of three speakers and I'm the moderator. And uh, the three speakers come from the Singapore International Arbitration Center in Singapore. The, uh, there's a barrister uh, from London who specializes in international arbitration. And then the third speaker is actually an in-house arbitration lawyer in Egypt, which is kind of cool. So I uh, hope you guys can join. Uh, I think that's going to be a really, really great session. But in any event, yeah, we run these weekly sessions. Next week is about international banking. The week after that is about intellectual property. So if you guys register for this one, then you'll be on the mailing list and you'll get to kind of get notifications about all those other sessions. And also if you add me on LinkedIn, I'm the only Rohan Billy Moria in the world, I think. So I'm fairly easy to find. Uh, then, you know, you'll get to see all my posts and all of that. But that's kind of a little bit about me. Uh, but again, I think in this uh, session, please at any time, if you have any questions, put them into the chat. Uh, I'm happy to address them as we go or definitely when we do have time at the end. Um, but let me start off by saying that, you know, I'm a mentor and coach uh, a few law students. And the first question I always ask them is, and, and this is the question I'm going to start off by asking you as well, is I want you to think about what is it that drives you? What is it that made you want to become a law student in the first place? You know, some of us, we become law students and lawyers because we want to make lots and lots of money. Or we want to do it because we want to change the world. Or we want to do it because we want to defend the oppressed. Whatever the reason is, and there's no right or wrong answer, I think sometimes it's important to just you know, take a step back and really think again as to why we, we became law students and lawyers in the first place. Because we tend to forget about it sometimes. And so, yeah, just important to remind us. Because there's this Japanese concept. Uh, it's called Ikigai. I'll put it in the chat again, Ikigai. Essentially, what Ikigai says is that whatever we want to do in life as a career, as a profession, should ideally tick four boxes, right? So the first box is, is whatever you're planning to do, is it something that the world actually needs? Is there a need for it? That's the first question. The second question is, is it something that you can be paid well for? Is it going to you know, pay your rent? Is this something you can sustain yourself on? The third question is, is it something that you're good at? Is it something that you have an aptitude for? And then the fourth and final question is, is it something that you have a passion for? Is it something that you know, gets you excited, that you're curious about, that you want to learn more about? Because I think you know, those are the sort of things that you really need to be thinking about when you're trying to figure out which path to go down. So for example, um, I'm going to pick on somebody now. So uh, Prakya. I can't see you, but if you want to unmute your microphone and just let me know, what area of law are you most interested in? Can I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you see me, sir? Yeah, I can see you as well now. Yes, yes, sir. So the area of law I am interested in is business law, corporate law, and second, uh, second is humanitarian law. Two fields I okay. am most interested in. Okay. First excellent. one for the money and the second one is for, you know. Okay. That's good. That's good. No, thank you for sharing. Okay. So, so like humanitarian, let's, let's pick humanitarian. So let's say, Rakhya, you came to me and you're like, you know, Rohan, I'm, I'm thinking of this or I'm thinking of this. I'm thinking of humanitarian law. Let's take that first. Uh, what should I do? So I'd say, okay, let's take a step back. Let's ask ourselves these questions, right? So why do you want to become a humanitarian lawyer? Is it because you want to, you know, save the world? Is it because you want to be like Amal Clooney, George Clooney's wife, who's a fantastic human rights and humanitarian lawyer? Or is it because of something else? Um, but then going through that Ikigai framework, we'd say, okay, the first question is humanitarian lawyers. Is it something the world actually needs? I think that's a yes. I think, you know, there's a lot of humanitarian issues around the world. So lawyers are needed. So that's an easy tick. 
Second question is, is this something you can be paid well for? Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on who you work for and where you, where you work, but you can be paid a decent salary. You, it's not going to be big bucks like, you know, corporate or banking law, but it's going to be quite interesting. But if you do specialize in it and you want to become a barrister or something, then yes, there is a decent pay packet at the end of the day. Um, the third question is, is this something that you're good at? So that, that's where I would say, you know, uh, if you've done maybe an international humanitarian law subject at universe uh, at law school, you know, did you get good grades in it? Or have you maybe written a blog on it? Or have you written a journal article on it? Or do you have some sort of, you know, aptitude for it? And the fourth and final question is, is this something that you're actually interested in? Is something you have a passion for? Is something you're in, you know, excited about? If you said to me, yes, 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 you know, all four yeses, no issues, then I'd say fantastic. The next step is let's get you some work experience. Let's get you some work experience in that space because working day to day in an office or in a barrister's chambers or something on in a particular area of law is super different to studying about it in a textbook or in a classroom or reading about it in John Grisham thriller or watching it you know, on a TV show called Suits. Very, very different. So, you know, that, that's, that's the kind of thing that I would say is work experience is super important because when I um, went to London to join Linklater's, I thought for 100%, I was sure, sure, sure that I wanted to be an M&A, like a mergers and acquisitions lawyer. I wanted to be a corporate lawyer. And I kind of said, okay, that's what I want to do. It looks cool. It looks sophisticated. I'm going to be in the newspapers. I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be rich. No questions, Right. Um, so in, in the UK, a lot of the UK law firms, what they do is they offer what they call a training contract. So it's essentially two years and you get to experience four seats. So four rotations of six months each. So you get a taste of different departments, different things. You can either work in different departments, or you can go to one of their overseas offices if they have any, or you can go and work for one of their clients as a client secondment, they call it. So I uh, wanted to do corporate, right? But I said, okay, training contract means I get to do four different things. Let's see what happens. So what you do is you fill in your preferences on a preference form and then you give it to them. And then they say, okay, what do, where do we want to put this uh, lawyer or law student? So my first seat, they put me in the banking team, banking law. Now it wasn't my first preference. Uh, it was something I was not super you know, enthusiastic about, but I said, fine, you know, like, let's see what happens. And also, and I'm giving away my age now, but, but when I started at Linklater's, it was September 2008. Now, does anyone remember what happened in September 2008? I'm hopeful that most of you were born at that point. I think you were. Okay, September 2008 was when the global financial crisis happened. Yeah. So that, so in September, and, I, and I'm going to mix up my dates now, but in September, uh, on the Sunday, I think it was the 27th of September, Lehman Brothers went bust or insolvent. And on the Monday, which was the next day, this fresh faced, uh, I was much fresher faced back then, uh, lawyer started at Linklater's in the banking team. So while everybody else was running around trying to figure out what was going on in the world, I was trying to figure out how to use the photocopier and, and where the entrance was. So yeah, I, I think, you know, that first six months was a really great learning experience. Uh, but I said, okay, no, it's pretty good. Banking was good. But then my second seat was in corporate and m and I said, okay, no, no, this is what I want to do. This is what I've been wanting to do. It's going to be amazing. Uh, first two weeks, after that first two weeks, I realized very quickly, it's not what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, Personal preference. I mean, there's a lot of corporate lawyers I know who are very, very uh, happy and very ex uh, are excited in corporate and MA. But for me, it didn't work. Uh, for me, I wanted to do something a bit more tangible. I wanted to be able to, you know, point at something like a structure or a power plant and say that's what I was involved in building or, you know, negotiating. So that's kind of what brought me into the world of project finance. Project finance is essentially where you work on big projects like power plants, infrastructure, roads, bridges petrochemical plants, all that stuff. So that's kind of what I did. But anyway, so moral of that story is, I think that work experience is super, super important. So um, if however, Prakya, you know, you had said to me, which you did, which is, you know, 
it's not just humanitarian law. It's also kind of the corporate side of things that you're also interested in. Then I'd say, okay, definitely let's take a step back and let's figure out why you want to do one or the other. Let's get you some work experience in both those areas. Cause then, you know, you might realize that you might want to do it or not, not want to do it. Cause again, from my experience, you know, I, at one point wanted to help people and, you know, uh, be a legal aid lawyer. So, you know, you work in a legal aid clinic where people come in and they ask for free or yeah, minimal uh, cost legal advice. And I said, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to be helping people. That's going to be amazing. Uh, yeah, I did a week of that and I realized that that's not what I wanted to do again. So I, I think that work experience is super, super important. So that's kind of what I would say. Um, Cause uh, yeah, it's, it's important to, you know, figure out what is it that you want to do, ask yourself these questions and then kind of go into it from that perspective. But again, whilst you guys are thinking of questions to ask, uh, let me start off by maybe giving you a few tips and tricks on uh, two key documents, uh, which will form part of your journey um, during law school and also after law school, which are your CV or resume and your cover letter. So now let's make it interactive. So, you know, we've got quite a few people on this call, uh, 53. So in the chat, I want you all to answer this question for me. How many pages should your CV be? Okay, so you've got two, one to two, two, Parana says two, okay, two to three. You know, I once uh, asked, so I've done this uh, workshop at a few law schools. There was one law school, like, I'm not going to say which country or which uh, law school, but somebody said as many as possible was the answer. <laughs> so that's not the answer, guys. Um, all right, so one, two to three, okay. Three more seconds, three, two, one. All right, time's up. Okay, so the correct answer, I think at this stage of your journey when you're at, you're at law school is aim for a maximum, as a lot of you have said, is two pages, okay? So that's the magic number. Now, quite a few of you said one page. Now, one page, that one page requirement actually originates in, a, in a, a wonderful country of the United States of America. So I did a session, I did this session for a university in Hawaii, unfortunately, virtually, I would have loved to be in, in Hawaii, but uh, I did it last week. And they all, when I answered the, asked them this question, they all said one page, like straight out. So for, in, for the US, if you're applying to a US investment bank, or sometimes a US law firm, or sometimes a US law school, then yes, one page is kind of the guideline. But if nobody's told you anything about, you know, how many pages it needs to be, um, then two pages is kind of what you should be aiming for. Once you get out into the workforce and you got a few deals and cases under your belt, then maybe you could stretch it to three pages. But even then I would say, try and you know squeeze it into two pages um, because again, people don't really want to read long essays or uh, epics about your life. Uh, so, so that's what I would say. So anyway, so that's the length, right? But let's talk a little bit about the content of your CV. Now there's no like magic formula or set answer, but this is kind of my interpretation of it. So the first section of your CV at the top should ideally be a little bit about your personal details. So your name, your contact details, like your email address, your phone number, so that people can reach out to you, right? So again, feel free in the chat, to ask any questions about anything that I'm saying or anything that you think I missed uh, or anything you disagree with. I would love to hear that. So anyway, so the first section is around your personal details. The next section can be around your education, right? So this is where you set out, you know, what year to what year, which university, which degree, um, which city. And then if you have like some sort of grade or GPA average, then you put that in as well. And then you kind of go back in time as to any other courses or diplomas or certificate kind of degrees that you've done in your high school, maybe even, right? Then your next section is more around your work experience. Now, this is kind of where I think a lot of people when they're drafting their CVs, they pay a lot of attention to this section. So now the work experience, the one big call out I would make about this section, which I see way too often, is that you know a student will say, or even a lawyer will say, August 2020 to September 2020, internship at Shardul Amarjan Mangaldas, Delhi, India, corporate team. And that's it. 
And then they'll go to the next line. And they'll say December 2020 to January 2021 internship. Da, 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 da. Now, what's great about that one sentence that I mentioned earlier is that in one sentence, you've told the reader, you know, how long the internship was for, where it was, for, where, which firm, which department, which city. You've done that, right? But you haven't told the reader anything about what it is that you actually did at that internship or during that work experience. For all we know, for all the reader knows, you could have been just sitting at your desk watching Korean dramas on Netflix, right? So don't let anybody make assumptions about what you did. Just put in a couple of lines. Look, we know it's an internship. It's not going to be, you're not going to be arguing multi-million dollar tax cases in court, you know, during your first week. But at least put in a couple of lines saying, you know, assisting the corporate team with drafting documents or reviewing memos or editing briefs or whatever it is. Uh, just give a little bit of flavor so that people kind of have an idea of what it is that you did. Okay. And then the same thing. So you go back in time, any other internships that you did, any other work experience, so forth. Then the next section can be around your achievements, your extracurricular, your co-curricular. So anything other than studying and working. So this is where, like, you know, if you've uh, done any volunteering experience or you've done any mooting or mock trials or debating or written any journal articles, all that stuff. And you can kind of put it in in a nice orderly manner, maybe under separate subheadings. We've done quite a few things under each of those uh, categories. Then the final two sections, and I think these are the two sections that people, when they're drafting their CV, don't pay enough attention to. But I am going to tell you for a fact that when somebody's looking at your CV, that they are paying attention to these two sections. And those are firstly, your hobbies and interests. Now, I get a few law students in India and Nigeria specifically saying, oh, Rohan, you know, we've heard from a law firm that they're not interested in our hobbies and interests, that we should only focus on our education and our work experience and, you know, our grades and everything. And nobody wants to hear about our hobbies and interests. Now, I have a controversial view on this one, but I'm going to say it. I feel strongly that if any law firm or company out there doesn't want to read or hear about your hobbies and interests or what you're interested in outside of work, that law firm or company is not worth working for. They should be interested in who you are as a person outside of the office. They should be interested in what you're passionate about. You know, I had a student in Pakistan the other day said, Ron, I teach Mandarin to, I teach Chinese, Mandarin Chinese to students. Should I put that on my CV? It has nothing to do with law. Or I had a student in Wales in Cardiff saying, oh, I'm a, a, the captain of my soccer team. Should I put that in my CV? It has nothing to do with the law. Now to both those people and to all of you, because I know all of you have many, many interests. The answer to that question is going to be a resounding yes from me. Please put what you're interested in into your CV. Do not hide who you are. Your CV, your cover letter is meant to be about you. It's meant to tell your story. It's meant to tell us something about who you are as a person. So don't hide who you are. Because there's a few reasons, right? First reason is you can tell a lot about a person based on the interests that they have. So for example, to that person who's a captain of a soccer team, I would say captain means you're, you're you know, good at leadership. You've been through ups and downs. You know how to delegate. You're in a team. That means your team skills, all that stuff. You can kind of, you know, tell things about somebody. Uh, also, the second reason is you just don't know who's going to be reading your CV or looking at it. You know, you might say something in there which clicks with them, which connects with them. Maybe they're into soccer. Maybe they also speak Mandarin Chinese. You never know, right? So, you just, you don't know. So you might build a connection with them. Cause I have a story, which I'd love to share with you. So I have a friend in Sydney who's Indian originally, and he was applying to jobs, you know, a few years ago. And in his CV, he had put down in his hobbies and interests section that, you know, he's very interested in cricket and he plays for a local cricket team, nothing, you know, fancy or super advanced, but he played and he was really passionate about it and he loved it. Okay. So he sent his CV out to lots of law firms and he went in for interviews. He went in for an interview at a big US law firm that a lot of you would have heard about. And uh, he walks into the room and this very serious senior looking partner at the other end of the table. 
and you know they shake hands they say hi hello everything they sit down and before anything gets asked about work or grades or anything the partner has my friend's two page cv in his hand and he flips over the first page all that stuff about work experience all that stuff about education he flips over the first page and he goes to the second page and he goes straight to the hobbies and interest section he goes straight to the line about cricket and he looks at my friend and he says oh you like cricket do you and my friend in his head he's thinking oh my god did i say something wrong is this guy going to you know yell at me what have i done uh but he says he was honest right he said yes sir i'm i'm interested in cricket and i play for my local cricket team the partner put the cv down and for the next hour they talked about sachin tendulkar they talked about the ipl they talked about the world cup needless to say my friend got the job at the end of the day he and then also had a couple of very good years at the law firm more of the story is you just don't know who's going to be reading your cv so put your interests in don't hide who you are okay then the final section is around your referees or your references right now there are a couple of ways you can do this the old traditional way is that you would just put two or three names of referees into your cv and um with their contact details and then that would be it right now there's a bit of a risk associated with that approach so for example shruti if you in your cv you put dhiraj and you put um anamika as your two referees right and you send your cv out to 10 law firms okay so you've done it the next day anamika calls you and says oh hi shruti uh, i just wanted to let you know that uh, i don't want to be your referee anymore i don't think you're a very good lawyer so um sorry bye so should they you're in a bit of a trouble now because your cv is out there anamika's details are there with all the hr professionals at those firms somebody could call anamika and say hey what do you think of shruti and anamika may or may not say very nice things about you right so let's avoid that situation from even you know arising so the second approach and this is the one that i would suggest is simply under the in the references section simply saying these three magic words which are available on request okay now what those three magic words do are they give you two gifts they gift you a bit of time and they gift you a bit of flexibility i'll tell you why so let's say now shruti in your cv instead of putting you know anamika and uh, their just names in you had put available on request in and you send that cv out right now nobody at a law firm or company is going to get somebody's cv and immediately pick up the phone and call their referees that's not how it works how it works in reality is they'll look at it they'll figure out if you kind of fit in with what they're looking for then they might call you in for an interview they might do it virtually or over the phone then maybe as a second step or a third step or even as a final step they might say okay let's reach out to uh shruti's referees and see if you know there's anything that we need to be aware of right so putting available on request buys you a little bit of time it kind of gives you a bit of time to figure out who you want to put down as your referees for this particular job uh cuz you might think of somebody that you hadn't thought of you know when you had actually sent out your cv or you some they might say something during the interview and you're like oh wait a second i was thinking of putting amika um, but actually i should put nidhi you know what i mean so you can kind of adapt that way so that buys you time it also buys you flexibility because um at at you know a certain stage of, of your career you know after start to law school you know you might have two or three referees i know but after you worked for a few years you might have five or six uh and so what i do in when i'm applying for jobs is i have five or six referees so i know that you know i've worked with them they know me they'll say nice things about me when somebody calls them and so i trust them and they know that they're my referees as well so i've given them a heads up and so when i'm applying for jobs i look at that list of six people and i'll say okay i'm applying for a banking law position so i'll pick the two people from that list who i did banking law deals with and i'll put that into my uh, application or if i'm applying to the united nations or some international law job then i'll pick two people who i did international law transactions with and i'll put those uh, people into my application so again it just buys you a bit of flex so that's that's what i would say so available on request remember that one so we got a question from yashvi if we have various interests should we 
I'm assuming you wanted to say, should we put them in? And how to customize your resume based on the requirements of the organization. Okay. So if you have very interest, interest, should we put them in? I would say it depends how many interests you have. If you have 50, then maybe, you know, keep them to the top five. But yeah, I would say at least put in, you know, what you're really interested in and you actually do. Like don't say I'm interested in Formula One racing, but you've never watched a race in your life and you don't know anything about it. Because again, the problem is that if somebody sees Formula One racing on your CV, they're going to ask you about it. And if you don't know anything about it, then they'll say, mm, she was clearly or he was clearly lying on their CV, right? So you don't want to do that because I love Formula One racing. And if I see Formula One on your CV, I'm going to ask you about it. Uh, so that, that's the kind of watch out there. Uh, customizing your resume. Now, I think your CV, it's essentially quite a static document, right? Because it's not really meant to be completely overhauled and changed depending on which job you're applying for. However, you're right, you should try and tweak it and customize it a little bit at least, depending on which uh, organization or which job you're applying for. So for example, if you've got, after a few years of experience, you've got three banking cases you worked on, three litigation cases you worked on, and three M&A cases, and you're applying for an M&A job, then you might wanna you know, put those three M&A cases at the top, you might wanna remove some things, so that you know your CV is a bit more MA focused. You might want to do that. Yes, I think that, that, that's a good idea. But the real customization should be in your cover letter, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, Kishita said, with respect to work experience, should we explain <laughs> brief the work done in each organization? Or should we just mention the organization's name? So Kishita, like I said, you know, so you know, put in obviously the name of the company or the law firm, how long it was for, was it an internship or something else? which city, and then, yeah, put in at least a couple of lines as to, you know, what you did during that time, uh, whether it was, you know, drafting or reviewing, or if you know the names of the cases that you worked on then put those in as well, because that adds a little bit of, uh, you know, customization again. But if you're putting cases or matters in, then make sure that they're public knowledge. Uh, you don't want to put in something confidential or sensitive into your CV because people can get a bit annoyed about that especially at the firm that you worked at. So that, that's that's the kind of watch out I would have. So that's your CV, right? Then let's talk about your cover letter. Now your cover letter is essentially something, or your cover email is essentially something that should accompany your CV when you're applying for things. Because that's where you really customize your uh, statements, your approach. That's where you tell people why you want to be working at that particular company or that law firm. So this is where you say, you know, who you are, uh, what you're doing in terms of, you know, you're studying uh, at this university, uh, what subjects you're most interested in, why you want to work for that law firm or company, which department, which um, area, uh, and show them, show them that you put a little bit of effort in, show them you've done the research into not only the company, but also the team, but also the boss, but also the industry, just everything, just make it so that they know that, you know, uh, you've done the homework. Don't do what a lot of people do, which is just churn out the same cover letter for every job that they apply for and just change the name of the company and name of the uh, industry or something. Don't do that because people can tell and people are not idiots. So they can tell looking at your document that, you know, this person is not putting the effort and it's just this cover letter took them maybe a minute to draft because they just used a previous template. So uh, don't do that. Spend at least half an hour on each cover letter do a little bit of research, do a little bit of Googling, stalk the boss or the team on LinkedIn, you know, just make sure that you know enough about what you're getting into. Uh, Cause those are the cover letters that will impress. So for example, um, uh, Yashvi, right? If, if you send me a cover letter and you were applying for a job at KFC in the legal team, and you showed that you had done the research, you talked about, you know, maybe some interesting deal that KFC had just done and uh, you know the fast food industry or what challenges we're facing in COVID. For example, during COVID, uh, a lot of restaurants had to close down their dine-in services, but their delivery services uh, were doing really well, but the restaurants that didn't have proper delivery suffered. You know, all these things happened. Uh, so if you can show that you've done the research that you've like at least read a little bit, you have that commercial awareness, that would be super impressive, right? And so if I have that CV in my in my left hand, and if I had a CV and a cover letter in my right hand of 
a law student who's been to Harvard Law School, who's won gold medals all of his life. And, uh, you know, he's done everything uh, under the sun. But I can tell from his uh, cover letter that he hasn't actually done any research into my industry or my company or me or my team. Uh, he's just kind of churned the same thing out and just relied on his grades and his uh, Harvard degree. Uh, I would pick you, Yashri. I would pick your cover letter 100% of the time. So that shows how powerful a cover letter can be. So make sure that you guys put in a decent amount of effort into it because it's going to show. Okay. So that's your cover letter. Then maybe another area that we should chat about, again, whilst you guys are thinking of more questions, is around uh, this. Okay, so Bhagyashri is asked, uh, which should be more eye-catchy, a good cover letter or email? Hmm. So again, look, sometimes uh, the law firm or company has its internal website or portal that they've set up and you need to attach a Word document or you need to attach it as a PDF. You know, they have all these requirements. Uh, obviously a letter looks a lot nicer than an email because you can format it and put fonts and you know, all that stuff. Uh, but an email is fine as well. Uh, it just depends on what you're doing and what the limitations are, but there's no set rule. But a, cover, a, a letter which, you know, if you can kind of sign it at the bottom, you know, with your actual pen and scan it and send it. It looks kind of nice. PDFs, by the way, always look better than Word documents. So that's one thing that you should keep in mind. The other thing I would say about CVs and cover letters actually is, and this is uh, quite a common thing, unfortunately, is that a lot of typos and it, regardless of whether you're a student or a senior lawyer, I've seen so many, so many silly mistakes made in CVs and cover letters that you know, if you were applying for an operations job or a finance job or a marketing job, attention to detail, yes, it's important, but people are not going to care if you've got a comma instead of a semicolon or something, right? Um, it doesn't matter. But unfortunately, as lawyers, that's the kind of stuff, firstly, that they're looking for from their potential new candidate or potential new team member is attention to detail. And also, you know, lawyers, when we look at CVs and cover letters, we, our eyes are sort of trained to pick up on stuff like that. So unfortunately, if you send a couple of letter email or, or a CV with lots of typos or even a couple of typos, uh, even though they might be small ones, it's going to stand out and it's not going to be standing out in a good way for you. So definitely reread your documents, make sure that you know exactly what's in them and, and that you, you know, uh, proofread them. But also another thing I would suggest is, you know, swap your CV and cover letter with a friend of yours. So maybe Bhagyashri, you can swap it with Kishita and vice versa. And, and you just kind of look at each other's documents. So that'll do a few things. Firstly, you know, Bhagyashri, if you send your cover letter to Kishita, you've got a new fresh pair of eyes looking at this document that you've probably been looking at for about a you know, few hours and you're tired and you don't want to look at it anymore. And she or he may spot new things or, or you know, different things that you may not have seen. So that's the first thing. The second thing also is you might see something in their CV and cover letter that you're like, oh, wait, that's a nice approach. Or, or you might suggest to them that actually, no, why don't you put this section first and you might move this or your education section is good, but it doesn't have enough detail or whatever it is, right? So you can kind of get ideas from each other. So use, use two brains are better than one, okay? So, so use that. So I would say, okay. So then the next sort of topic, if we can call it that, is around networking. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about this, this thing called networking. Uh, and when you get out, to, you know, into the legal world, uh, you're working in a law firm, you know, Ananya, you know, your boss might say to you, Ananya, go to that conference and hand out business cards. We want to win deals and win clients. So make sure that you're telling everybody about how great we are as a law firm and make sure that we win lots of deals by the time you come back. So you'll then go to the conferences and you hand out your business cards and you introduce yourself as a corporate and M&A lawyer and you'll try and win transactions. Okay, so networking, that's this, this word, right? So again, very controversial what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Let's all take a pledge on this call right now that this word networking, let's remove it from our vocabularies forever. 
and let's replace it with something called relationship building because that's essentially what we're doing right networking when even when you say it it has this very formal forced connotation to it that you must go network that you must go you know hand out business cards and flyers that's not how you win clients and win deals that's not how it works in reality how it works in reality is you go to these conferences or you go to these seminars and you meet people you ask them about you know themselves what they're interested in outside of work their hobbies their interests like i said uh you ask them what challenges they're facing in their industry you know ask them questions get to know them and then maybe once they trust you once they know they 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 comfortable with you then you can maybe say oh by the way you know i'm a corporate and mna lawyer at this firm and you know you just mentioned that you were facing that challenge last uh, year we actually just worked on a transaction for a client where they were facing the same challenge this is the kind of thing i would suggest if you need more information why don't you uh, give us give me a call on monday or whatever it is that's the kind of thing you know people want value to be added to their lives and their careers they don't want somebody who comes up to them and says here's my business card we're amazing uh what deals are you working on how can we get involved how can we you know don't go in for that sales pitch and that's with anything in life so you know make sure you're relationship building all the time um i would say mm. okay cuz the other thing i would say and this is um uh, quite important is and again this applies to everything in life your career your love life your life in general it is more important so hear me it is more important to be interested than to be interesting okay more important to be interested than interesting so when you're having a conversation with someone whether it's a potential client or a potential boyfriend or whatever it is be interested in them hear what they have to say ask them questions you know ask what's going on in their lives what 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 they're facing rather than trying to make yourself look interesting you know telling them about yourself and how cool you are and how amazing your law firm is or anything like that so i think that's super important and that you'll start to see the difference when when you make a more conscious effort to do that okay the other thing about relationship building is how do we do it right so let's say in this virtual world that we're all living in and it's uh, covid heavy unfortunately uh we can't go to in person conferences so how do we build relationships well one really good way is firstly you attend these virtual workshops like the law ninjas one or you know any of the other ones and you can also use platforms like linkedin so linkedin is obviously a fantastic tool where you can you know get to know uh, who's who's out there jobs what trends what what the latest news is in the legal world and elsewhere and you can kind of see what's what's happening and and uh what um uh what is uh you know going on in the world so th- so that's what i would say is use linkedin as a platform if you don't have a linkedin account today that's fine but i want you all to open a linkedin account by the end of the weekend okay promise me that because it will have an impact on how you perceive your legal career and your visibility of what options are available not only in india but also elsewhere in the world so it's super powerful i found out about my job at kfc through the linkedin jobs page if i wasn't on linkedin i wouldn't have found out about the job and i wouldn't be here today to be very honest so it's a it's a great tool The other thing I would say is, you know, I get a lot of questions from students and lawyers saying, "Oh, I want to be as as, you know, a few of you said earlier, I think Prakash you said you want to be an international humanitarian law, right? Lawyer." I would say, "Look, I'm not an international humanitarian lawyer, so I'm not an expert in that space. However, my advice to any of you who are looking to do something, which I know all of you are uh, after law school, is two words. Look up So what look up means is two things. The first thing is if you want to be something like international humanitarian lawyer, look at the people above you who are doing what you want to do. 
So look at five or 10 profiles of international humanitarian lawyers who are you know, already successful, who are already doing the things that you want to do later on in your career. And you can easily do this either through a quick Google search or you can look, at, uh, look them up on LinkedIn. So you, on LinkedIn, you can see people's profiles, you can see the education, uh, what work experience they've had, where they worked, how long for, all that stuff. So it's super, super insightful. And what you will see, let's say you're looking at 10 humanitarian lawyers profiles. First thing you will see is that not all of them have the same journey. All of them have done different things. All of them have different backgrounds, right? So that's the first thing. But the second thing you'll see is that there are patterns though. So you will see that, okay, eight out of the 10 have a master's degrees or six out of the 10 speak two or more languages, whatever it is. Uh, and you'll start to get ideas, okay, I am here, I want to get there. Eight out of the 10 did this to get to where they are. So let me think about how do I get there? You know what I mean? So you just kind of, it just kind of gets you thinking about these things. So that's the first aspect of looking up is actually looking at people's profiles. The second part of that, which is slightly more tricky is speaking to the people who are doing what you want to do. Now, obviously you can't pick up the phone and call an international humanitarian law and a lawyer in London and say, hi, please uh, tell me how you did it. It's not going to work. But what you could do uh, is, and this sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, is find those people on LinkedIn and send them a message and say, hi, my name is Shruti. I am very interested in this field of international tax law that you're uh, practicing in. Uh, I'm particularly interested in this one case that you worked on or this one uh, journal article that you wrote last year. And uh, I, if you have 15 minutes next week, I would love to have a conversation with you uh, over Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever, just to hear about your journey and you know, if you can maybe provide me with some guidance. Now, a few things can happen, right? Either that person is not gonna reply, which does happen, or they'll say no, if they're really evil, or they might say yes. You never know. You have nothing to lose, right? So you might as well take a chance. And the other thing you need to say, you need to sort of realize is that lawyers, senior lawyers out there, a lot of them actually do want to mentor and coach and help junior professionals, but either they don't have the time or they don't think they have the time, or they uh, don't know how to do it. Like they don't have a good enough platform to be able to do it. And so they don't do it. So, but if you approach them and you approach them in a polite, respectful, friendly way, and it's not a sales pitch, like here's my CV, please help me, which unfortunately does happen a lot. Um, you, you might get some positive traction. You might get some positive uh, feelings and sentiment. So, so try that, I would say. Uh, don't, you know, stalk or hassle people, but, just, just take a chance, okay? So I'm conscious that we have just over 10 minutes, uh, but let me, get, let me tell you guys a story from my own personal life, which will hopefully answer quite a few of the questions that you may have at the back of your mind or may inspire you, hopefully. So when I was in my fourth year of law school, and if you guys remember in Australia, it's five years, so my second last year, I was at that point where all my friends around me were applying for jobs at law firms and they were looking for what to do. And most, if not all of them were applying for jobs at law firms in Australia. I looked at that option, I thought about it and I realized very quickly that's not what I wanted to do. So I wanted to go overseas. I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to think outside the box. But I had zero idea about how to do that because nobody had told me about it. Nobody had given me a workshop on it. And so I didn't know where to start. So I did what uh, any crazy person would do. I took out my laptop on a Sunday afternoon and I typed out a very simple cover email. It said, dear, and then I would insert the person's name. So dear sir, my name is Rowan Bilimoria and I would like to apply for an internship at your law firm this summer. My CV is attached. Kind regards, Rohan. Worst cover email in the world. Please never, any of you, please never write a cover email like that. Okay. But I didn't know any better because nobody taught me. So I just did what I thought was right. 
Uh, and then I attached my two page CV to that email and I sent it. And I'm not joking when I say this, I sent it to 100 law firms around the world. And when I say around the world, I mean, literally every city I could think of. So New York, London, Dubai, Istanbul, Singapore, everywhere. Now using the chat, I want you guys to answer this question for me. Out of the 100 emails that I sent, how many responses, whether a yes or a no or a maybe, how many responses do you think I got? Twenty one, very specific. I love it. Ten, ten to twenty. Nobody's saying a hundred, but fair enough. Ten to twenty. Probably none. Sorry, I'm not buying you a beer when I come to. Well, I can't buy you a beer in Gujarat anyway. I can't buy. I'm not gonna buy you a dinner. Ten, thirty-five, one, thirty percent positive. I love it. Five to six. All right, three more seconds. Three. Two, one, all right, time's up. All right, so the correct answer to this question is in fact 10. So quite a few have got it, so well done. But here comes the second part of that question, which is kind of the more important part. Out of those 10 responses that I got, how many yes, how many yes responses did I get? Five, one, four, two, five, zero. I mean, it says zero. All right. Two, five. Okay. Three more seconds. Three, two, one. Quite a few of you are shy. One to two. All right. Time's up. The correct answer, ladies and gentlemen, is given by Ame. Big fat zero. So I was rejected 100 times which I can assure you didn't do great things with my ego. However, there was one email where the HR person at the law firm said, dear Rohan, thank you for your application. We um, see in your CV that you've got some litigation experience as a paralegal at a law firm in Sydney. We unfortunately do not have a litigation department in our firm. So you might want to apply somewhere else. They were very nice about it. Now, all of us have faced rejection emails and letters, right? Now, there are three ways you can deal with that kind of an email or letter. You can either do nothing. So you just kind of say to yourself, um, you know, they've kind of told me to go elsewhere. So what's the point in even replying? So I'll just kind of move on with my life. That's the first approach. Second approach is you do the whole polite response where you say, oh, thank you for considering my application. I agree with your suggestion and I will you know, keep you posted of my progress or something. That's like an option. Third option, and this is the one that I think each and every single one of you should adopt. And the one that I adopted in that, that situation is you fight for what you want. So in my situation, I replied to that HR representative and I said, thank you so much for considering my uh, email. I agree that I only have litigation experience at this stage. However, my interest and my passion lies in corporate and mergers and acquisitions. And I believe firmly that an internship at your law firm this summer would be not just a small step, but a giant leap towards achieving my vision of being a corporate lawyer one day. So I threw in some man on the moon, Neil Armstrong language in there to jazz things up. Send that email out. Two days later, I get a reply from them saying, Thank you so much for your email, Rohan. We would like to offer you a four-week internship at our law firm. It, you'll have to pay for your own flights. You'll have to pay for your own accommodation. We'll pay you a very basic salary. Take it or leave it. I said, I'll take it. So that firm turned out to be a firm called Linklaters, and it was their office in Singapore. So I flew from Sydney to Singapore on a budget airline because I couldn't afford anything else. I stayed at the YMCA in Singapore, which still gives me nightmares. And I worked very, very hard for those four weeks. As a result of my hard work, I then got opportunities with them and all those other places I mentioned. So there are two morals to that story, guys. The first moral to that story is that you, me, everybody else in the world 
we're going to face rejection at every single stage of our lives and our career. It's going to happen in our professional life and our personal life. It's going to happen over email, over text, over WhatsApp, over conversations. It's going to happen. It's kind of like death and taxes. Rejection also very inevitable. Okay. But do not let any other person in the world dictate how you should lead your life or how you should craft your career. If you've done the homework, if you've figured out what is it that drives you, why you wanted to become a lawyer in the first place, your Ikigai framework, if you've done all that and you are sure that this is the thing that you want to do and you know, you're hundred percent sure about it, then put all your time, effort, energy, love into that, make it happen. You're not going to be accepted to every single job or every single master's program you apply for, right? That's just not possible, but just keep pushing forward. Okay. So don't let rejection get you down. If we had more time, I could tell you maybe about 17 stories of how I've been rejected from jobs and something better or something different has come along. Okay. Don't let uh, one no get you down or, or let you deviate from your chosen path. Okay. That's the first thing. The second thing or the second moral of that story is that one email, one conversation, one WhatsApp message you send, one workshop you attend can change your life forever. Okay. Now look at my situation, right? If I hadn't sent that one email to that particular email address in Singapore that day, what would have happened? I would have been rejected by all the 99 other people around the world. Right. And I would have probably said to myself, Okay, everybody around the world doesn't think I'm a very good lawyer, so I must be terrible. So I'll just settle with whatever my friends are doing here. I'll just compromise. I'll join a small law firm, law firm in Sydney, and that'll be my life. I can assure you if I had done that, I wouldn't be where I am today, and I definitely wouldn't be talking to you all today. So just take a chance, roll the dice and never think twice about it because you just don't know what will happen. Okay. So just keep the faith. All right. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Again, I hope I've been able to answer some of your questions or some of your concerns. If not, this is not meant to be a high, here's my wisdom for an hour and then goodbye. You never see me again. This is meant to be a high, you know, I'd love to stay involved and, and get to know all of you on an individual basis. So what I'm going to do now, guys, and this is something I, I haven't done for any other law school yet in the world. So don't tell anyone I've done this is if you go to law ninjas.co co, there is a, a, like a subscription thing where you just pay a, a normal amount every month and you get access to all the workshops that I've done. There are about 12 hours worth of workshops there with speakers from Amazon, Twitter, Facebook, uh, big law firms, big companies around the world talking about careers, talking about what it's like to be a lawyer in a law firm, in-house, in the uh, tech sector and, and all these things that I'm sure you're all interested in. And if you do that uh, in the next couple of hours, so by the end of the day, then whoever does that and, and sticks on after the seven day, you get seven days free, by the way, after the seven days free, then I'll give you whoever signs up, I'll give you a 20 minute uh, individual coaching session. Okay. I don't do this usually. So um, check it out. Uh, but in any event, uh, hopefully you guys will all add me on LinkedIn and message me and, and let me know if I can be of any help. And then also if you scroll up uh, the link for that workshop, that's starting in about an hour, so if you haven't had enough of my voice, you'll get to hear me for another hour. Uh, and it's about international arbitration. So hopefully that's something that you'll all be uh, interested in. But um, thank you so much to Parnas. Thank you so much to Prakya. Thank you so much to Dr. Patel and all of you guys for listening to my voice and looking at my face for an hour. I'm sure it wasn't a very uh, pleasant process, but uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I would, if there are any questions left from the participants, Okay, I guess so. Uh, all the questions are done. Sure. Maybe okay. we can take a photo. Yes, yes. Uh, first, uh, can we... Uh, yes, we can take the photo and then ma'am can proceed with the vote of thanks. Okay. Yes. I request all of you to... So there's a question for you. Yeah, so I was just going to say, Arti, so all those workshops I was talking about, you know, the Law Ninjas workshops that happen every Thursday, 
they happen online. They're free. Uh, it takes literally 10 seconds to register for them. They're pretty easy to register for. Uh, so yeah, uh, hopefully that can uh, be something that uh, you're interested in. Yes, I request all, oh. all the participants to start their cameras so we can take a group picture. You know, interestingly, and you guys probably know this better than I do, but Bilimoria, my surname, comes from a town in Gujarat called Bilimora, which uh, I've never been to. So when travel starts again, I'm going to come visit you guys. You got to take me out for a decent meal, and I'll also go visit Bilimora. Apparently, a lot of people in Bilimoria have my, have in Bilimora have my surname, which is a bit weird, but anyway. Oh, nice to see you, Parnas. Hello, sir. Participants, I request you all to start your cameras, please, for the group photo. Yeah. If you guys don't put your cameras on, I'm not going to talk to you. All right, Prakya, you let me know. I can't see everybody's faces. So. All right, you can probably take the photo, Prakya, I think. Okay, okay, sir. So, hello? Yep. Am I paused? Okay, okay, I'm not. So, and one photo. Oh, you can just take a screenshot. Right? Okay, sir. I've taken the photo. Okay. Thanks so much. All right. So uh, now I would like uh, Devarathi ma'am, uh, I would request Devarathi ma'am to give a vote of thanks to sir. Okay. Uh, so I have been listening to you, uh, Rohan, and uh, it was really amazing because uh, I must say that uh, Okay, I must say that most of our students who are present here, uh, they some of them are definitely going to uh, look for a better, uh, like you know, future. And uh, some of them have just joined the law college, and uh, they all have just you know passed a, a time when they had to be online for their like you know coaching classes or for their like you know tuitions or even for you know their classes. Uh, say for example, this online uh, like institutional classes and i guess that the way you described the entire thing that means that you know how the the students are going to make their cvs and most interestingly i i really felt very good that when you said that uh, the cv must not cross uh, like you know maximum two pages um, uh, earlier when i was a young person i mean you know even though i'm still young so when you I was are. a very young person, yes. So I was uh, like, you know, applying for so many uh, law firms, etc. So I did not know that, you know, how to uh, make my CV. And presently, when I look at my CV, I'm ashamed because it crosses 24 pages. So wow. I'm sorry. But still then I do understand that, you know, how I should minimize. I mean, it had been a learning period for me. I mean, this past, uh, like, you know, so a couple of minutes had been uh, a, like a real experience for me. So on behalf of United World School of Law, Karnavati University, I take this opportunity to thank you again. And I request, and I would, I would rather like, you know, command, uh, like, you know, all the students to get connected with uh, like uh, Rohan. And uh, as Rohan, you have stated that, you know, we should not use the term networking, but we should uh, like, you know, rather um, use this term as like, you know, growing our, um, what should I say? Connections. Relationship you know, so building. Relationship, yes. yes. So this should be something which is very positive. And uh, we look forward to have you again here. Uh, like, let's hope that it, you come and visit our campus. Uh, sure. Let's hope sure. that this like pandemic ends soon. I know that it is not going to end soon, but let's hope that we are going to see you uh, in our campus very soon. 
again thank you so much rohan and also thank you students for having a very patient hearing and uh, again thank you to kanavati university for giving us all this opportunity to hear you thank you so much thank you thank sir you thank, so thank you much. everyone Thank you. Thank you uh, just the final thing, final thing, uh, something that you said, Debrati, really uh, triggered uh, something in my mind. I want to say something to you guys. So you've obviously heard me say things like, you know, uh, look up and you've heard me say things like, yes. you know, about being more interesting than interested than interesting. But another thing I will say, and this is my own personal quote, so I need to get a trademark on it soon, is it is... Wait, 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 let me, let me get it right. If you're not visible, you're invisible. Okay. So what that means is, and this applies to your life again, it applies to particularly if you think about LinkedIn, is that there's so many law students, and there's so many lawyers out there who are members of these social networking groups and these platforms mm -hmm. like LinkedIn, but they don't do anything on them. They don't write anything. Absolutely. They don't post anything. They don't comment on anything. And so they're just invisible. The ones Absolutely. and the students and the lawyers who do really, really well and who get, you know, at the forefront of people's minds are the ones who just write something. You know, it doesn't even have to be an original thought. It can be you're sharing somebody else's article or a new case judgment, and you're writing maybe a line about what you think about it. So I want you all to start being more visible. And I want you all to start really actively doing that because that's super, super important. So I just wanted to end with that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Go forward. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hope you have a fantastic evening. And I hope I'll see you at the workshop in about 54 minutes. Take care.